There we go, guys. Everyone ready? Yes. Okay. Good morning. We are Kronos Aeronautics, and this is our final presentation on our performance enhancements and structural layout. <laughs> For the duration of this presentation, we'll be referring to the screen on your left as the primary, and the screen to your right <coughs> as the secondary. The aircraft you see behind me is the CA-1 Yellow Jacket. It's a result of going through the research, design, testing, and evaluation process simulated here at Embry-Riddle through the preliminary design and detailed design courses. The team working on this consists of myself, Brian Ferguson, who is this semester's design team lead, and we have our test plan team made up of Mike Byard, Alex Benz, Jason Ryan, and Kelly Ramirez, as well as our test model team made up of Vincent Arminio, Ikidichi Namrioso, and Austin Gardner. There we go. On the secondary screen, that was, we're dealing with some technical difficulties here, so we can't see what's over here, and if you go back one. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so on the secondary screen, we have an overview here. What we're going over today is our motivation and background, some preliminary design results, as well as the result of our uh, testing and evaluation process we went through. For our team, this includes an initial round of wind tunnel testing to validate our original design, followed by recommended modifications that need to be made before our final wind tunnel test to be able to better conclude the configuration for the CA1 Yellow Jacket. Now some background on Reno Air Racing. Reno Air Racing takes place at Reno State Airport, which is over 5,000 feet up in elevation, and has two runways, a 7,600 foot runway and a 9,000 foot runway. These runways facilitate a uh, multitude of classes, ranging from IF1 and biplane classes, all the way up to the jet and unlimited ones, with the tightest course being the IF1 and biplane race track. On the secondary screen, IF1 Air Racing takes place all around the world. With these races consisting of eight aircraft per heat, with all of them required to use that seven-year-old Lycoming O200 engine, as well as using two-bladed fixed-pitch propellers and having to have a minimum empty weight of 500 pounds. So now why are we doing this project? Well, the current iPhone rulebook has been incredibly restricted and has been limiting performance, which has been a re resulting in a stagnation in aircraft design. This is evident in the fact that two-thirds of the current race teams are using the same airplane. The last time the rules were changed was in 1968. When this happened, a whole influx of new racers came in as each one was exploring and trying to push the limits within the rules. We wish to bring this back to our own update and create the IF1 Plus racing category. This category will increase performance and encourage competition once again as teams will be pushing the limits. On the secondary screen are the proposed rule changes to make up this new IF1 Plus racing category. This includes removing that 70-year-old Lycoming O200 engine, moving the 66-foot square to minimum wing area, as well as reducing the 500-pound empty weight limit and allowing for two to four-bladed propellers, many variety to be used. And with that, I'd like to introduce Austin Gardner to, Gunker, to, to talk about our aircraft description and our predicted performance. Thank you, Brian. So on the primary screen behind me is the three view of the Yellow Jacket. It is a track configuration aircraft with a TP100 turboprop engine in the front, a pilot in the middle, and an empennage at the rear. It has a wingspan of 19 feet 4 inches, a length of 16 feet 3 inches, and has a wing area of 60 feet squared. This is notably less than the 66 feet squared wing uh, minimum requirements set by current IF1 standards. It also has a prop diameter of 5 feet 7 inches and uses a four-bladed propeller. This is also not allowed in the current iPhone rulebook. The aircraft weighs 504 pounds empty and has a takeoff weight of 722 pounds. On the secondary screen is our CG locations for these weights, with the empty weight being further forward and the takeoff weight being further aft. It is important to note that these next couple of slides will be our predicted aircraft performance calculated in our preliminary aircraft design phase last semester. We predicted that the aircraft will have a stall velocity of 61 knots, a takeoff distance of 926 feet, 
and a landing distance of 2,097 feet. This is well within the 7,600 foot runway distance requirement set by the uh, Reno State Airport. On the primary screen, we have our predicted 2D to 3D lift curve slope with the full 3D wing at Mach 0.4, which is our race velocity, uh, outlined in red. In this configuration, we have a max stall uh, angle of 12 degrees and a max uh, lift coefficient of 0 0.76. We move on to our predicted uh, static stability derivatives. On the primary screen, we have our longitudinal static stability for pitch, which has a negative slope, which shows that the aircraft is stable. As you pitch up, it wants to pitch back down to normal flight. On the secondary screen, we have our predicted uh, lateral static stability for roll. As you roll left, it wants to roll back right, as shown by this negative slope, indicating stability. Finally, we have our predicted directional static stability for yaw, which has a positive slope, which shows that as the aircraft yaws, it wants to weather main back into the flow, also indicating stability. This shows that our aircraft is predicted to be stable in all three axes. We have our power available, power required plots at sea level behind me and at 5,200 feet, which is our race altitude on the secondary screen. On our at, uh, sea level, we have a maximum level flight speed of 246 knots, <coughs> and as we increase for our race altitude, we increase our flight velocity to 251 knots. And on our uh, as we extend as we uh, increase our altitude to 10,000 feet, we also continue to increase our flight level speed at 264 knots. Finally, we have our predicted flight envelope on the primary screen. The, uh, the left side of the envelope is uh, generated from our stall lines, and the top and the bottom are from our RFP, which dictates that our aircraft needs to be able to handle six Gs positive and negative three Gs. Uh, the uh, right side of the envelope is from our maximum level flight speeds. On the secondary screen is our specific excess power plots, with the horizontal dashed line being our race altitude. As you follow this line to our zero feet per minute line, it intersects it at 251 knots, which correlates to our predicted flight envelope and our power available power required plots. I'll hand it off to Ikidichi Namdinosu for our structural layout and analysis. Thank you, Austin. <coughs> the primary screen shows the structural layout for the yellow jacket which shows all the components that will be used within the fuselage skin, wing skin, and ampullary skin. The secondary screen shows the materials that go along with these components. All materials being used are composites except for the fuselage, which is metal since it will have to be welded together. The primary screen shows the structural layout for the wing. It consists of a foam center with uh, ribs and sparse stiffness shown in red, surrounded by a load-bearing skin panel, which has been made transparent for illustration purposes. The secondary, is, sorry, it's also important to note that the, there are three tabs at the root cord of the wing. These are used to attach the wing to the fuselage. This is done because the yellow jacket will be transported to and from the airport, airport using trucks and will not actually do, uh, be used for any purposes other than wasting. The secondary screen shows the lift distribution for the wing. This was estimated using a Schrenk's approximation. The primary screen shows the dimensions for the wing's internal structure. The spars have a uniform thickness of one inch, while the ribs have a uniform thickness of 0.25 inches. The tabs that attach the wing to the fuselage have a uniform thickness of 1.2 inches. Varying rib spacing is used to prevent interference with the ailerons and properly distribute the stress across the wing. The secondary screen shows the ailerons for the wing, which has a similar structure with a foam center surrounded by the same skin panel as the wing. The primary screen shows the structure for the empennage, which is similar to the wing with the foam center in yellow, ribs and spars in red, with a skin panel, load-bearing skin panel, transparent. 
The second resume shows the lift distribution for the horizontal hotel, also estimated using a Shrek's approximation. The primary screen shows the dimensions for the horizontal tail structure, while the secondary screen shows the dimensions for the vertical tail structure. 0.25 inch is used as a thickness for ribs and spars for both the horizontal and vertical tails. Varying ribs and spar locations are used to prevent interference with the control surfaces for both of these uh, surfaces. The primary screen shows the structure for the fuselage. This consists of a roll cage, which is basically a truss structure with round beam members, reinforced by frames or bulkheads, evenly spaced. The frames have a thickness of 0.375 inches. It's also important to note the tabs attached to this fuselage, which will connect the wing to the fuselage. These are reinforced for more rigidity. Having picked a design, it was necessary to validate this design using finite element analysis software. This was done using the ANSYS workbench. The wing was imported in, and the ultimate load of 8,500 pounds gotten from our 6G lo load limit times the 1.5 safety factor was distributed across the bottom of the wing. The bolt attachment holes were used as the support locations for the analysis. The table on the primary screen shows the results of the analysis. The stresses that will be experienced for all components are less than the yield strength of the materials in use, which creates a positive margin of safety, therefore showing that the wing will not fail under this loading. The secondary screen shows the deflection of the wing under the loading. The maximum deflection of 3.5 inches occurs at the wing tip as expected. On the primary screen, you'd see the results for the final element analysis for the horizontal tail. The maximum lift produced by the tail of 1,500 pounds was calculated, and this was distributed across the bottom of the tail, and the root cord of the tail was used as the fixed support location for the analysis. Again, the stresses experienced by all components for the horizontal tail are less than the yield strengths of, for the materials being used, uh, creating a positive margin of safety and showing that uh, failure will not occur. The secondary screen shows the deformation of this tail under this loading. The max deformation occurs at the tail end of the tip, and this is 0.34 inches, which is not significant. Next, I would like to introduce Alexander Benz, who will be going over wind tunnel test equipment. Thank you, Ikidichi. To validate the design of the yellow jacket, Kronos Aeronautics decided to conduct wind tunnel testing. Wind tunnel testing was carried out at the Nancy and Tracy Dorland Wind Tunnel Facility here in Prescott, Arizona. You will see the facility shown on the primary screen. Note the locations of the test section, as well as the data acquisition computer and the wind tunnel control panel. On the secondary screen, you will see that this is a closed circuit wind tunnel used for testing. In addition, the test section is removable, but this has a series of black lights to allow for aid in, in tough visualization. The test section is also 32 inches by 45 inches wide. The maximum speed of the wind tunnel is 230 feet per second, with a pyramidal balance allowing for changes in angle of attack as well as size of angle. Pyramidal balance is operated by a data acquisition computer. On the primary screen, you will see a pyramidal balance used for testing. The pyramidal balance allows for, for measurements of angle of attack, as well as, or sorry, measurements of moment, as well as measures of forces. This is a six component pyramidal balance, meaning that there are six sources of measurement for this balance. In addition, you will, this pyramidal balance is operated by the data acquisition computer. For the data acquisition, the pyramidal balance um, through the data acquisition computer is operated using a LabVIEW file. This LabVIEW file has a series of inputs that can be put into it, such as the model geometry, as well as atmospheric conditions. The data is collected at specified angles determined by Kronos Aeronautics, and checklists and procedures are also used by Kronos Aeronautics to allow for smooth operation of the wind tunnel and to make sure that everything is tested as required. An image of the model tested is shown on the secondary screen. I would now like to introduce Michael Beyer, who will be discussing our, our initial wind tunnel model and results. 
Thank you, Alex. The first part of developing our wind tunnel model was selecting its size. We did this using five scale considerations. First consideration was keeping our tunnel blockage less than 5%. What this meant to us is that when we place our tunnel, our model in the tunnel and crank it up to our maximum angle of attack of 24 degrees, the frontal area needs to be less than 5% of the cross-sectional test section area. And this is to reduce the venturi effect that would artificially increase velocity around the model. The second uh, consideration was to keep the maximum lift produced by the model less than 40 pounds to avoid damaging delicate components of the force balance. Third consideration was to keep the wingspan of the model less than 80% of the total width of the tunnel to reduce the aerodynamic wall effects. The fourth and fifth considerations involve making a model that can resist aeroelastic clutter and be, have a strong enough structure to support the 40 pounds max load. What this meant to us is that our lifting surfaces needed to be thick enough to allow a strengthening seal substructure. On the secondary screen is our selected one-tenth scale model of, our, of the yellow jacket. This model has just under a two-foot wingspan and is 19 and a half inches long. This model was manufactured in components using our campus's rapid prototyping lab and aerospace fabrication equipment. Uh, the model was then assembled using a combination of steel substructure, which is highlighted on the primary screen, screws, and glue. Which components were assembled with screws as opposed to glue was, dis was decided upon based on which needed to be removable during testing. The secondary screen shows three configurations that we tested in the one tunnel. These include the full aircraft, the wing body, and the fuselage only. To be able to move between these configurations in our testing time, the model needed to be easily configurable. This was accomplished, as you can see, in the following animation. The, each wing of the yellow jacket has a steel support structure. What did you do? It's not working. Back off one and then go forward. No, back one. Try to go back in. Each, sorry about that. Each wing of the yellow jacket has a one eighth steel rods inserted through their length, uh, which give the wings the strength and rigidity required for testing. The empennage is made out of four uh, three printed plastic components and a steel substructure. These components are then assembled into a single assembly using steel rods and glue. Once this assembly is complete, uh, it can be inserted into the fuselage and attached with two small screws. The main fuselage steel support structure is inserted from the front of the model and is then attached to the wind tunnel balance mount using two screws. At this point, the wings of the yellow jacket can be inserted from the sides uh, using their reinforced tabs and then attached to the model using four screws. Finally, the front fuselage component is slid along a set of rails and attached with a single screw, which is then concealed behind a pressure fit nose cone. This final configuration of the yellow jacket model allows for easy and quick configuration and minimizes the amount of uh, screws on the outside that would interfere with our aerodynamics. Before testing, the X and Z CG locations of the model were determined. Uh, the secondary screen shows how the X location was determined by balancing the model on a set of vertical pillars. Now, an error was made when measuring this location. However, it was mathematically corrected later, and which is reflected in our following data. Before testing, uh, before data could be getting from the wind tunnel, uh, two tests were performed on the model. First was to confirm that we could support our 40 pound max load lift. This was done by spreading 40 pounds over our wing. Uh, during this test, no failure or cracking was occurred. Second test was our air elastic flutter test. It was done by placing our model in the wind tunnel and setting it to its max angle of attack. Uh, then the air, the tunnel speed was increased slowly and until air elastic flutter occurred at the wing tip. At this point, the velocity was backed off and our max tunnel velocity of 98 feet per second was selected. The three configurations I mentioned earlier, full aircraft, wing body, and fuselage only, were tested through the angle attack ranges shown on the primary screen from negative four to 24, and the beta angles shown on the secondary screen from zero to 10 degrees. A couple of primary things we learned from our first wind tunnel test was that our wing had a fairly quick stall. This is shown in the following video. It starts at 12 degrees angle of attack, moves, and now to 13 degrees. As you can see in that single uh, degree angle attack movement, the, the tufts quickly experience turbulent flow and then are being affected by the reverse flow caused by wing stall. This onset of wing stall can also be seen on the secondary screen in our lift curve. 
A second a takeaway from our first test is we had higher drag in the wind tunnel than we had predicted for our, our preliminary model. Our chronos dynamics has determined, has identified two contributing factors to this higher drag, one being the limitations of testing a propeller-driven aircraft in a wind tunnel. Our model has neither a spinning propeller to drive flow over the aircraft or an engine to draw air through the intake and out of the exhausts. What this results in is that as air enters the intake, it stagnates, causing drag, and then spills out as turbulent flow from the intake, which can be seen in our flow visualization on the right side of the primary screen. The second contributing factor is the interaction between the force balance and the model. Again, this causes turbulent flow, this time on the back of our model, as seen on the left side of the primary screen. Next, I'd like to introduce Kelly Ramirez, who will be going over our initial wind tunnel data evaluation and our recommended model changes. shows the predicted wing and the wing, configuration, the wing body configuration for the first initial test. The wing body configuration shows a slightly maximum coefficient of wind um, of around 13 degrees stall. The wing body configuration uh, has a slight higher max coefficient of lift, but also decreased in lift per stall by 20%. On the secondary screen, it shows the foreign parameters for both predicted and the initial model with percent differences. As you can see, the biggest difference was the lift curve slopes. The primary screen shows the predicted and full model configuration from the first initial wind tunnel test. The full model configuration resulted with a higher drag. This was due to the two contributing drag factors as mentioned before. The, this resulted with a minimum coefficient of drag difference of 119% between the predicted and the full model configuration. The primary screen shows the pitching moment coefficient for both the predicted and uh, initial model configurations. For the full model configuration and wing body configurations, the slopes were relatively the same until the wings stalled. Once the wings stall, these lines become, become a positive slope, uh, which resulted in instability between 12 and 15 degrees. After 15 degrees, these lines become neutrally stable and shift back to slightly negative slope. The secondary sh screen shows a rolling moment coefficient for both the predicted and wind tunnel model configurations. As you can see, the full model configurations were all relatively stable. The dis distance between the full model configuration and the fuselage, fuselage only configuration showed that the empennage had some contribution to roll. The primary screen shows the yawing moment coefficient for both the predicted and the model configurations. The full model configuration was overall stable. Between the full model configuration and the fuselage only uh, configuration resulted that the empennage had significant contribution to yaw. The secondary screen shows all static stability, st static stability derivatives for both predicted and uh, the initial model with the stable criteria. Uh, the important note to take away from this table is that all static stability derivatives for the initial model were stable. After analyzing the initial model data, Kronos recommended these changes to the model to improve, to improve both in performance and stability. Redesigning the horizontal tail, blending the stagnation points, changing the airflow of the wing, and increasing the sweep angle of the wing. Moving forward, Kronos implemented these two changes to the final model. Redesigning, the first change was redesigning the horizontal tail. Although the model was stable on all three axes, the horizontal tail had minimal authority in both performance and stability. Increasing the horizontal tail size will, will increase the stability contributions as well as shifting the aerodynamic center further aft. The second change was changing the airfoil of the wing. Changing the airfoil to a thinner, low-lift airfoil will reduce the parasitic drive and also shift the aerodynamic center further aft. 
This will also allow, this air bowl must also uh, obtain the required lift for all race maneuvers and have a gradual stop for safety purposes. Now I'd like to introduce Vincent Armino, who will be discussing model modifications and final wind tunnel tests. Thank you, Kelly. As Kelly mentioned, two modifications were made to our wind tunnel model for the final wind tunnel test. These modifications were made to the wing as well as the empennage. The wing was modified by changing the airfoil from a NACA 63212 to a NACA 66209 as pictured on the primary screen. On the secondary screen is a ghost view of the new wing component. The steel structure, pictured in red, remains similar to the original wind tunnel model. However, the steel rods from the tip to the root were decreased from a 1 8 inch diameter to a 1 16 inch diameter to allow for the thinner airfoil design. In addition, to make up for the thinner uh, rods, an extra rod was added in between the original two. The second modification was made to the empennage. The empennage was modified by increasing the horizontal tail area by 29%. This area increase was applied in both the spanwise and forwardwise direction uh, to maintain the same proportional characteristics. On the secondary screen, again, is a ghost view of the empennage component. The structural uh, components pictured in red remained identical to the original component, and this allowed for the seamless integration of this component back to the, the rest of the original wind tunnel model. With these two mod new modifications, four new configurations were tested. These configurations included the old wing, new empennage, new wing, new empennage, new wing, no empennage, and new wing, old empennage configurations. After the wind tunnel testing, the data was carefully analyzed. On the primary screen, is plotted the coefficient of lift versus the angle of attack. As is evident, all four configurations share very similar characteristics, with the slight exception of the configuration involving the older wing stalling two degrees after the other three configurations at 10 degrees. On the secondary screen, is plotted the coefficient of drag against the angle of attack. Again, all four configurations share very similar characteristics, with the exception, uh, the slight exception of the old, the old wing new empennage configuration straying slightly from the other three configurations between 10 and 14 degrees angle of attack. Now on the primary screen, is plotted the coefficient of rolling moment against the angle of attack. Again, as is evident, all four configurations share very similar characteristics up until about 10 degrees angle of attack, at which point the aircraft stalls and the four configurations stray slightly from each other. On the secondary screen is the coefficient of rolling moment against the side slip angle. As is evident, all four, all four configurations share a general downward slope, indicating that the, uh, that the aircraft is stable in roll. Now on the primary screen is the coefficient of yawing moment plotted against the side flip angle. As is evident, all four configurations here share uh, virtually the same upward slope, indicating that the aircraft is stable and yaw. After closely analyzing the new wind tunnel data and comparing it to the original wind tunnel data, Kronos Aeronautics decided that the ideal configuration was a new wing, new empennage configuration. This will be justified in the next section. Now I'd like to introduce Jason Meyer, who will, covering, who will be covering the selected model performance comparison. Thank you, Vincent. On our primary screen, you will notice our CL Alpha comparison for our initial model in green, and our final, our selected model in red. As you can see, we have a slight increase in our CL in our race region, which is gonna be from zero to five degrees. Now, I'd like to note that this increase in CL would also mean a slight increase in induced drag as well. However, since we do have a thinner airfoil in our selective model, and the majority of our drag comes from parasitic drag, this is not a huge concern for us. And I would like to reiterate the fact that we have a slightly, uh, well, we have a really abrupt stall char characteristic uh, from our initial wind tunnel model. And however, we have a very gradual stall characteristic as observed in our secondary screen. From 10 to 16 degrees, we have a very gradual uh, stall characteristic of progressing from the root cord of the wing to the tip cord of the wing. Now on our primary screen, you will observe our CV alpha comparison between the two models. We have a CV min of 0.0606 for our initial model, 
and 0 0.0624 for a selective model. Now this drag is uh, drag data is uh, considered very minimal in difference due to the fact that there is a margin of error that is innately induced by the wind tunnel test itself. And uh, on the secondary screen, you'll be reminded of the effects of our selected configuration. We'll be going with the 66209 airfoil, which uh, provides us with the better stall characteristics. And we'll be going with the 29% larger empennage uh, to provide us with a better pitch stability during takeoff. We'll be using 25% less deflection from an elevator. All, uh, this is all while providing us with a very minimal drag penalty. Now on our primary screen, you'll be observing our power available versus power required at sea level, where we have our initial uh, model's top speed of 176 knots, and our selected model's top speed of 174 knots. In our secondary screen, you'll observe our power available versus power required at race altitude, where we have our initial model's top speed of 180 knots, and our selected model's uh, 179 knots. Now on our primary screen, you'll observe our power available versus power required plot at 10,000 feet, where we have our initial model's top speed of 184 knots, and our selected model's top speed of 183 knots. Now on our primary screen, you'll observe our initial model specific excess power, and our secondary screen, our selected model specific excess power. The most important thing to take away from these two slides are gonna be our absolute ceiling of 35,000 feet for both configuration, and you'll notice that our, our drag difference has a very minimal uh, impact on our performance. Now on our primary screen, you'll observe our initial model VN diagram, and our secondary screen, our selected model VN diagram. The most important thing to take away from these two slides are gonna be our maximum G limit of six Gs, and our minimum G limit of negative three, uh, defined by our RFP. Now on our primary screen, you'll observe our rolling moment coefficient versus our angle of attack comparison. That is our aircraft response in pitch with variations of, with variations of angle of attack. As you can see, both of our aircraft models are stable in pitch, indicated by the native slope. On our secondary screen, you'll notice our rolling moment coefficient versus our side slope angle comparison. That is our aircraft response in roll with variations of side slope angle. As you can see, both of our models are stable in roll, indicated by the native slope. Now on our primary screen, you'll notice our yaw moment coefficient versus our side slope angle comparison. That is our aircraft response in yaw with variations of side slope angle. As you can see, both of our models are stable in yaw, indicated by the positive slope. Now I'd like to reintroduce Brian Ferguson, who will be going over our cost analysis, conclusions, and recommendations. Thank you, Jason. So as a result of going through the research, design, testing, and evaluation process, and combining with our material and equipment costs, the yellow jacket comes out to be $560,000. This does include one extra engine, which is typical amongst other air racing teams. On our secondary screen, we have our maintenance and operation cost proposed as $34,500, as well as a proposed life cycle cost of $514,000. Both these are taking over a 10 year life cycle with the aircraft competing in a full race season per year. On the primary slide up to this point, Chronos Aeronautics has worked 1,770 1, hours, with the majority of these hours coming from the professional development category. This category is deemed as hours spent in class, as well as time spent outside of class performing research or furthering your own knowledge. On the secondary screen in black, is the recommended hours for a team throughout the semester. That is two hours outside of class, three or one hour inside of class. As by the dashed red line shows that Chronos Aeronautics has been on track throughout the entire semester. On the primary screen, we have our cost breakdown as a result of these hours, totaling up to $85,100. Again, the majority of this cost associated with the professional development category. Now to our conclusions and recommendations. After performing ANSYS analysis in both the wing and empennage using an 8,500 pound load, which is the equivalent of our 9G ultimate load limit, we experienced minimal deflection through finite element analysis, and neither of the components experienced yielding. This in turn verifies the structural layout of the chosen components. After our initial round of wind tunnel testing, we learned that our wing had poor stall characteristics, which was evident through the flow visualization 
as well as the fact that the empennage had a very limited influence on overall aircraft performance. Moving on to our final wind tunnel test, we, we tested a new wing, which ended up improving the stall characteristics, making them more gradual. This is desirable when racing at low altitudes in close formation with other aircraft. As well as that the larger empennage that was 29% bigger reduced the required deflection of the elevator by 25%, as well as having a negligible impact on drag and performance and maintaining stability in all three axes. On our secondary slide, Kronos Aeronautics recommends the development of a flight test article to better gather performance characteristics due to the limitations of wind tunnel testing we experienced when having a propeller-driven aircraft. On this flight test article, we recommend the use of the new wing to utilize the improved stall characteristics, as well as using the 29% larger empennage for its stability, reduction in elevator deflection required, and negligible impact in overall performance. We believe this com combination combines safety, stability, and controllability into one package and can set a benchmark for iPhone Plus racing. Thank you guys, and do you have any questions? Fantastic panel to ask questions uh, today. I would just, uh, since we have about 20 minutes for questions, could you limit it, uh, Chris, to uh, uh, five minutes for questions? That runs over only by 20 minutes. So, uh, yes, if we could limit those questions, and if we have time at the end, we'll come back. So, we'll start off with Dr. Butler. First of all, outstanding. I wish I was back in school, so that's, uh, you did a nice job. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions in Drupal Lab, but let me start with one on the design process. You, uh, late in the presentation, when you got to the wind tunnel testing, started talking about the design iteration process where you learned certain things from the testing and then went back and decided on uh, sort of different combinations of changes that you would make, and then you went through that iterative process to try to optimize it. My question is earlier in the process, so when you first started um, designing this, this is what, what I see up here on the screen was obviously not the first design that came out of your, your group. So could you talk a little bit about sort of the iterative process that you went through pre-testing? You, you had to have gone through different ideas, different concepts, etc. Would you just share a little bit with the group about the design iteration process pre-wind tunnel testing? on any aspect of it. I know there's a lot of different pieces to it. Sure thing, I'd like to pass up to Mike Byer to go over the process for selecting the new wind tunnel airfoil changes. No, no, hold on. But just so I understand, I understand the process when you got to the wind tunnel that you just said, okay, this, we're gonna try to change it, go back and test it. I'm saying before you even got to the wind tunnel. Back to pre day Yeah, pre got exactly. It. I was thinking between the two tests. No, no, uh, early, early, early on. on. Back, back to learn to take it or go sure. <laughs> So how we started that process was we looked at similar aircraft within the categories of racing as well as in weight and size. From that, we gathered initial estimates for weight, wing area, and then performed constraint analysis, which gave us a design point. From that design point, we could start then developing power requirements for doing performance specifications. Then from there, working with the drag, the airfoil group, they need to uh, determine how much lift we needed for our estimated weight, and from there, iterating these performance and aerodynamic characteristics, we worked to the weight and uh, performance levels we wanted. From there, we then designed structurally around that to make sure we could implement the chosen airfoil, empennage areas, and associated components into the aircraft. Does that give you a good understanding? Yeah. Then from there, into our detail semester, we then tested that design in the initial wind tunnel, then we made our recommendations and some changes before a second round of wind tunnel testing. So just, just a side quick question. So on your time curve, the 1,770 hours, roughly where on that curve did you actually get to the wind tunnel in terms of how many hours did you put in before you actually started um, testing? Initial testing probably began about 35% into okay. that. Okay. For this semester, we had, when we had two wind tunnel test sessions that were broken apart by uh, probably about another 30%. Thank you. 
I think one of your other questions was uh, in the preliminary phase, in the conceptual design phase, they spent about a month working on the conceptual design and they looked at everything from canards to pusher aircraft and we went through and eliminated all of those, but did consider all of those as we went through. Did you have anything yeah, else? Sure. Sure. I'll come back later. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance. <laughs> Got a lot of them here. So. I'd like to start by saying congratulations. You guys did really well, I think. Um, I was excited to see where this was going to go after pre semester and uh, get a bit disappointed. Um, so I'll start off with the, the easier questions, and then I'll leave uh, the hard ones for us. <laughs> um, and most of these, I want to say, were covered in prelims, so I'm just asking for my memory. Um, going kind of to slide 19, 20-ish on the design of the, the main wing structure, um, I notice you you opted not to necessarily go with a main spar, but more or less two secondary spars. I was curious what the reasoning for that design was and what performance is expected out of that design. So when I was, so in Quillen, when the initial design for the wing, the spar locations were recommendations from design textbooks, like, uh, well, mainly the Roscom textbook. Uh, but then when I was carrying out the structural analysis, I went through a couple of iterations to better, um, to, for better results, basically. I, add, I did add in a main spar, right where you see the uh, middle uh, tab for the attachment. There was a spar in the middle, I added that in. That did help with the amount of deflection, but it did not help with the amount of stress that was experienced by the wing. So. The third attachment point in the middle that you see was crucial in order to reduce the amount of stress that was experienced along, along with the addition of uh, more ribs. It, if, I don't know if you remember, but in Cleveland, we only had, I think, three or four ribs, which I, one of the panelist members mentioned was insufficient and was white. So uh, the main changes were adding the middle third attachment tab and also increasing the number of uh, Waves. So yeah, I did try putting in uh, a spar. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is on uh, slide 24. Um, so the skin is not the load bearing section, if I remember my error structures correctly. Uh, your margin of safety for your ribs and spars, does that seem a little low? For the ribs and spars? Uh, yes, it might be low, but based on the material I picked, so I used the CES Edupack software to pick the material, and they give a range of values for the yield strength. I, in order to, for, to, to make a conservative analysis, I always use the lower end of value, so that's like the lowest limit for the yield strength. So if I had used like the average or the maximum, that margin of safety will be higher. And this is, so yeah, I don't know if that uh, answers your question better or? You're right, it doesn't necessarily exceed the yield stress, but your margin is very narrow, and I, I would be concerned about that, especially in the best conditions. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, next, with regards to preparation for testing, um, y'all mentioned a lot about your predicted results versus your tested results. Um, where did these predicted values come? Is there a CFD analysis, uh, ANSYS formula, or something, or the rules of thumb calculations? Um, where did you get the data that you were trying to validate? Those predictive values came from our preliminary design uh, semester, which those are based on equations found in textbooks and calculations. Okay. No CFD analysis. Okay. Uh, the last questions I have are more, more on the project management side. Um, Slide 62, uh, cost for an engine, is that, you say engine and then you note that it's a spare, is that cost just for the spare engine or is that for two engines, the primary and the backup? That's the cost for a spare. Okay. 
Uh, where would the cost of the actual engine be? Was it the raw materials? Correct. Okay. Um, and then the next slide, 63. Um, uh, purely from a, a customer standpoint, when you're noting that you have professional development as 40% of your time, how are you defining uh, professional development? So professional development is time spent in class as well as outside, which is performing research, furthering your own knowledge, or working on something that isn't explicitly broken out into those categories. So for example, you know, model preparation, fabrication, that kind of thing. And being students, a lot of this is the first time for us, so there's a heavier influence on the research side. All right, thank you. Uh, that's one of the hard questions. <laughs> All right, I'm just a warm up act. These guys have the hard ones. Um, so, a couple, uh, first thing, you guys did a lot of work. This is really cool to see Freeland turning into detail and kind of the evolution that the design has taken. Um, so, a couple, uh, couple, three questions that I've gotten, maybe I'll only get to two. Um, why, so during your side slip testing, uh, you tested out to 10 degrees positive. Why did you only test positive beta, and why was 10 the number you went to? I'd like to pass off to Kelly Ramirez to talk about this. <coughs> Since it was a symmetrical uh, airflow for the, uh, it's a symmetrical design, we only went to 10 uh, sides of angle, which would also project into the um, negative so you have data to say that it's a symmetrical design? Yes. Well, it's we designed it symmetrically. symmetrical. Okay, so yeah. is that an assumption or is that is that a thing you have data for? That's where, that's where I'm going, is be careful, because if you assume that you have symmetry and it turns out you didn't, then not testing half of the, half of the test envelope might be a bit too much of an assumption. But, uh, so why did you choose 10 degrees? Uh, that was recommended for our, our um, the wind tunnel test. Um, Where did the recommendation come from? Uh, mostly from the previous, uh, previous uh, design uh, groups and also from recommended from my professor as well. Okay, so um, in crossman landings, what beta do you guys get to? If you were going to do that. Okay, so the big thing that I'm hitting on is requirements based testing, right? So, your design, you should have some requirement, and then you're going to test up to that requirement to verify or validate that you actually got to there, uh, rather than you know doing what's been done before or doing what someone told you to do. Uh, make sure that you've got reasons for why you're going to certain conditions. Um, so yeah, big requirements based testing thing. The other one that I want to hit on is slides 40 and 41. Well, yeah, 40 and 41. Um, okay, so we've got slide 40, and I see your prediction there, and now we have the actual. Go to slide 41. Okay, so now we have the prediction and the actual. So my question is, which is the bigger error, and which is going to be harder to correct? Between forty and forty-one, uh, a bigger you know percent difference is definitely in the drag, um, as far as a predicted to our tested drag. Right. Um, and, and part of that you know is like I mentioned from the limitations of our design in a wind tunnel. Um, you it, that's going to be definitely the more difficult one. You'd have to go into some other type of testing. You have to expand beyond wind tunnel testing to be able to get and what this what the performance is in regards to drag of this aircraft actually would be. Okay, so you're saying that 41 is the bigger, is the bigger error. Okay, yes, let's go back to 40. So 40, what I see, the prediction is I see linear to five degrees and then a little bit of a bend and basically linear from about six-ish degrees up until your stall at about 11 and a half or so. So what I see is two piecewise linear um, uh, curves, or maybe it's linear till five degrees, and then there's a very gentle curve after that. So what I would suggest is that the, the characteristic of your prediction, of your prediction curve, is not linear. Whereas your test results are showing very linear, all the way up till 10 and a little bit more degrees. 
So the what you're trying to characterize in, in my mind is not just the points and how far the points are from the prediction to the actual. It's actually the characteristics of the curve. So whether it's a first order, second order, third order approximation that you're using. You know, hypothetically, if you would um, if you would predict if you would predicted a third order polynomial, right? So it's going up and down. The average might be, if you go point to point, might be perfect. But you can see that prediction is crap. And that's what I want you to kind of think about a little bit, is how do you build those production curves? Because to me, that's where you have a good model. If you go to 41, that's a bias. That's a whole lot easier to correct out um, okay. based, on this, based on this chart. Now, these guys have a lot more experience in modeling, so I'll totally defer to them if they disagree. But uh, the idea here is predict, test, validate. That's a big thing we, we stressed at, at Test Pilot School. So you're going to have a prediction, you're going to do a test, and that's going to validate whether or not your model is good enough to be using for other things that you can't actually test. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, I'd like to reiterate, great job, guys. I hope the presentation is pretty well polished, and a lot of really good information. And I was here three years ago, so now I'm much work you guys put in, so it's a lot of fun. Um, my first question is, why don't you guys have your model with you? Because you talk about it literally the whole time, and it's not anywhere in the room. So, I mean, it's just something little, I mean, but you work real hard, might as well show it up. I mean, especially when you're talking about the model, just like hold it up, point it there. You know, it's a lot easier than just looking at the slides, right? We currently have our model outside by the poster on display, and we figured having photos would be enough, but that's a great recommendation. Yeah, just little things, it's not a deal, but just cool, you guys work so hard on it, might as well. Showed off, right? Um, I think my biggest question, um, if you go to slide 14, I'll we'll just look at that one for example, and then um, if you go to slide uh, 56, uh, that was close. Uh, well, anyways, your two power required and power variable sets of blocks are very different. Uh, if you guys pick that up, but you have, uh, for example, 184 is your uh, speed right there. And then if you go back to the other side, it's like 246. Yes, that's correct. That's when uh, doing these calculations for the ones using the model, the experimental data has a much higher drag associated with it, which greatly reduced that top speed. That's why there's such a stark difference. Okay, yeah, definitely make sure you say that because you kind of just went over it and said this is what we got. And then I started looking back and forth like these are supposed to be the same plots. So try to point that out. Uh, just because at that point I kind of was really confused with what had happened uh, right there. Um, and, then, and then I guess I'll just reiterate the requirements based testing. And, and also, you were talking about your performance at the end, like how uh, the aircraft would perform actually in the race. You try to link that to your testing somehow so you can be like, hey, this is why, why we're doing this sort of test and why we're trying to prove that, not just to you know, not just do a test, if that makes sense. So, overall, really great job. I'll pass it off. Got to reiterate the good job, guys. Can you go to slide 38, please? So this is kind of related to Chris's question about correcting out bias. So looking at the F section, you had made a comment during this slide that uh, there was interference from the force balance. How do you correct that out? Pass it off that way. So we do take a, uh, a tear value um, before, so, sorry, uh, let me redefine define that. So before we put our model in the tunnel, we ramp up the tunnel to our test velocity and get a, a set of forces and moments from just the force balance that's in there. We do get that value. What we don't have in there is the component of our balance that goes, that is embedded into our aircraft. So th there's that about a two inch steel, uh, piece of steel above there that, um, was not uh, subtracted out from our, our, our resulting data. So if you want to correct that bias, you need to test and, uh, that section of steel in the wind tunnel by itself. You could, but the interaction, though, it's between the two. I don't know how you're going to correct that out. Do you do the interference correction? So you got a portion of the tear piece. Are you guys still using the Barbara Ray and Pope for those people in tunnel testing books? So we do have the Pope. We, we mostly have refer to the Pope textbook. There's really an awesome section in there for tear and interference correction testing. Testing an inverted model with another post in the ceiling to help get rid of that problem. Okay, That's thank you. We'll look at that. Get into mental health testing at any point in your career, you absolutely will be exposed to that. 
Next question I got for you is kind of two rolled into one. What's your certification basis for the airplane? So the certification basis for this aircraft, this is a, defined as an experimental aircraft, and so it follows no strict CFR requirements other than being airworthy and safe to fly. I heard you say multiple times throughout the presentation that your 6G requirement came from the RFP, and also I picked up on slide 10A, you have a 61 knot stall requirement, not necessarily a requirement, but stall velocity. Do you, did you happen to look at any of the Part 23 requirements and did those numbers seem coincidental? We did not compare it to the CFR requirements because we're experimental. Okay. The Part 23 requirements for acrobatic aircraft are plus 6 minus 3 Gs, so those are actually derived from the Part 23 certification requirements. And also that 61 knot stall speed is very important in that design requirement too because it's the one that keeps you from having to increase your uh, emergency landing crash load factors for 23 562. Some of the design requirements that play into all of this are not necessarily coincidental, just a few Great work, guys. Thank you. All right, guys, good job. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, when you are talking about 2D, um, 2D to 3D um, lift curves and things like that, uh, try to be more specific about what you mean by that. 2Ds are obviously just air flow, but are you talking about the main wing? Doors on the tail, what are you talking about there? And when you're talking about the 3D correction, are you just talking about wing only? Are you talking wing plus body? Um, then you get the model versus wind tunnel corrections. Uh, nowhere did I hear about round number of matches, if, you, if that was a concern. If you wanted to match it, uh, or if you couldn't match it, explain that away. Um, so that was another thing. And then some of the comparisons were predicted wing versus full model, which doesn't seem like a proper comparison. So when you're comparing those left production ones, that didn't mean anything because the comparisons are apples and oranges, in my opinion. Um, then the same thing, takeoff and landing distances, you have a predicted value in there, but um, nowhere during predictions, maybe this was covered in film, but maybe like just drop some sources, right? Like this came from Roscoe, that came from or you use brigade growth equation, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, one question I had was, um, where you do the depth distribution? Was that distribution based on max takeoff weight or weight spin? You're referring to the shrinks approximation? Yeah. What was that weight, weight based on? Yes, it was takeoff. It was based off the max takeoff. Max takeoff, okay. Yeah, that was just not mentioned. Because that would directly impact your results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep, that was it. I think there's some, uh, I think you can, I think we're gleaning too much out of this uh, 38 figure. Uh, dragging turbulence closer to the one doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a higher CD or things like that. And turbulence flow is not a bad thing. It's not, it's not the devil. Yeah. So. But good job otherwise, yeah. Well done. Thank you for your comments. Well done, I can see that I need to be a little bit quick. So, um, aerodynamically, you kept telling me that the vehicle is stable. That's great. What's the time to double or time to half? How controllable is it? In other words, am I as the pilot of this airplane going to be able to spend the 20 minutes in the race and get out, or will I lose control because I just can't act fast enough? That type of thing. So, stability and control, very important. So, um, take that into account. Um, then, kind of the overall wrap up of the questions that we should have been asking all along. Should I buy this? Can I be competitive? Well, as per using our experimental data, Jason, would you like to go to the back of the slide for that? Show them. So, and during our preliminary semester, we developed a pretty cool race time calculator that putting in current race, uh, current racers put out pretty much their exact lap time. With our predicted estimations, we were finishing more than half a lap ahead of them per race and had a very distinct increase in performance. But using 
the data that we had experimentally and what that resulted in is a not really competitive 54 second lap time compared to our old 39 second lap time. So we didn't want to like dwell on that. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the joy of engineering is marketing. So you need to go kind of close the loop on the control stacks, close the loop and say, this is what we're going to do to get the airplane to something we want to buy. You know, if you want to compete against Nemesis, it's in the sports category, that's kind of where you got to go. So kind of tell me how you're going to get back to where you had predicted values. And uh, one last point, all models are wrong, some are useful. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Uh, again, I want to say really good job today. It's well polished and put a lot of things together. One of the things I noticed was a lot of this presentation revolved around the wind tunnel model, and I didn't see a whole lot of comparison on Reynolds number. There wasn't a lot of discussion on Reynolds number, and that is probably the biggest crutch in the wind tunnel testing we're applying here um, at a university scale, just because you don't have a tunnel that can match Reynolds number. Um, the other thing about that was, which is a bigger problem do you guys think for your wind tunnel testing, the fact you didn't have a prop in a, through a pulling inlet, or the fact that you weren't on the outside. Both are significant, but the way you put the, the tufts are to simulate Reynolds number of effects by tripping the boundary layer and keeping uh, turbulent flow. I believe it would be the intake and the prop that would be the greatest effect on that. Okay. Um, the other thing was you said that your wind tunnel was capable of. Uh, 230 feet per second, and you guys were maxing out about 98 feet per second. Um, is that, that because of structural limitations? What did that do to your Reynolds number and your turbulent transition regions? Did you talk a lot about stall? We, we talked about the stall effects in the CL alpha curve. A lot of that is driven by land flow. And so I keep wanting to go back to what was the Reynolds number? Those are the Reynolds numbers that affects making Reynolds number corrections or something we don't didn't dive into with this uh, project this semester. So I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, the other one I had was on slide 48. Um, just a great one more, it's all you get. <laughs> it's a really fast one. No, no, one more. <laughs> Is there any data points between zero and ten degrees? Uh, between zero and ten degrees, uh, no, there is not. There's a, there's a whole background reasoning. There's some wind tunnel issues. Yeah. No, that was a mistake. <laughs> when they went back and retested it, they didn't test all the numbers. And also, to answer Chris's question about the uh, testing to uh, ten degrees of beta angle. That's a restriction on the balance. And that's fine. Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, that, that's I, was, I was hoping they would come up with that and say, you know, we couldn't go more than 10 degrees of size of the angle because it's a restriction on the balance. Yeah. So they couldn't do it. Okay, thanks guys.